outdoors with the comforts of home. Then cook up a five-star backpacking meal under the open sky, and the Hell's Canyon mailboat delivers a unique adventure. Hello and welcome to Exploring Idaho. Summer is upon us, and so is the camping season. You know, for a lot of us, that is where the dilemma begins, because we want to get out and enjoy all of Idaho's water and untamed woods, but we don't want to leave behind all the comforts of home. If that's your predicament, then I think we may have found your solution. Come along with us as we go boat camping on Idaho's pristine Dwarshack Reservoir. Idaho's Dwarshack Reservoir, 53 miles long and lined with pristine shores. It's one of the largest reservoirs in Idaho. No cabins or houses are allowed along the nearly 200 miles of densely forested shoreline. So Dwarshack Reservoir is also one of Idaho's quiet pockets of wilderness, where peace and tranquility are just a boat ride away. It's a gem. It really is. Dave Crawford lives in nearby Lewiston, but you'll find him most weekends running his boat on Dwarshack's clear blue water. We usually try to get up here about six or eight times a summer for a weekend camp out. Today, with his dog Katie leading the way, Dave heads for one of the many boat camps hidden in the trees. As you're going down the lake, you've got the lush green forest that comes down to the water on both sides. And, and you always see osprey flying around and catching fish. And it's not unusual to see deer down along the banks and uh, geese flying around. And it's just, it's kind of like pristine wilderness right in your own backyard. Because of Dwarshack's large size, boaters rarely feel the impact of other people on the water. Dozens of inlets and coves make it easy to find a private corner of paradise and set up camp. The campgrounds are great. The Forest Service and the uh, Corps of Engineers do an outstanding job with maintaining them. More than 100 of these mini camps, as they're called, are scattered throughout the shores. Every time somebody's been in here camping, the, the Corps of Engineers comes in and they clean up you know, rake the ground around here and pick up the wood and, and stack it. And the uh, outhouses are maintained. They've always, they're always clean and, and uh, tables are always level. The various campsites are rarely less than a quarter mile apart. Most campers never even see their neighbors. And there's no worry about cars pulling in late at night because there are no roads. The only way to get here is by boat. It is kind of fun. It's a little different than, than loading everything into the car and taking off. Uh, you've got to got to pack a little bit lighter. Uh, the first couple of times that we went out, we had the boat completely loaded down. The thing would barely float, and then and then uh, through repetition, we've gotten it down to a science where we can pack light light enough to have everything that we need and and be able to get away. Yeah, this is our first time here. We've planned on it for a couple years, but this is the first time and we're impressed. The Youngs heard about Dwarshack boat camping and just had to come and check it out for themselves. They've spent the last four days here enjoying the water, fishing, and relaxing. And now they're not sure they ever want to go home. Well, I think what we've noticed is just the fact that you can go out and find a nice camp spot and, and uh, if you're boating and not have to be real close to a lot of people. And you, have, you have a lot of choices that way. It's real remote and just beautiful. I love it. So many trees, lots and lots of big pine trees. Oh, and then there's lots of osprey. Uh, they, they fish. Uh, We've seen them fishing ever since we've been here, and they, they have more luck than we do. <laughs> the scenery is beautiful. It's just exceptional. Wildflowers and wildlife add color to each visit, and even if you don't spot wild animals, you'll find evidence of their presence. It's nice to just sit here and watch the water and listen to the wind. And breeze in the trees. One of Idaho's best kept wilderness secrets is just a boat ride away and right in your own backyard. You should. You should come up and try it sometime. It's an experience you'll, you'll not soon forget.
And get this, boat camping on Dwarshak Reservoir is free. However, the campsites are available on a first-come, first-served basis. Exploring Idaho, we'll be right back. Impress your taste buds and your friends with these gourmet camp food recipes, next on Exploring Idaho. So what's your idea of a good meal when you're out camping? Hot dogs? Canned chili? Maybe burgers on the grill? Well, you're about to meet a man who says you can eat like a king when you're out camping. All it takes is a little preparation and a taste for the gourmet. Often, camping in the great outdoors is an experience big on scenery and short on taste. But it doesn't have to be, says avid backpacker Chris Reed. With a little imagination, you can prepare meals like angel hair pasta with pesto and shrimp, or chili and cheese quesadillas with salsa. Recently, Chris took us to the great outdoors to give us his best tips on spicing up camp cooking. There's kind of a popular misconception that uh, people have to buy all this freeze-dried backpacking food, and there is some validity to this, and especially on longer trips when you have to be carrying a lot of food for multiple days, but you can actually eat pretty dang well if you just do a little pre-planning and uh, decide what you want. I have kind of moved away from the uh, freeze dry and actually just dry my own food, and it's amazing when you have one of these things what you can you can do with it. Um, this is a common food dehydrator, and you can find them just about anywhere. But you can dry all kinds of fruits and vegetables uh, to full-on meals: uh, chili and salsa and beans. It's just simple. You just put a little water in and just let it set. It just needs to soak up water like a sponge. I just usually carry a little uh, Tupperware-type container, something that'll seal up pretty well. And so, if you have to do a, some longer rehydration, you can do it while you're packing. But all you have to just do is just pour some of this stuff and. In the bowl, add a little water, and wait. Yeah, we did a little salsa here. Let's see how this is going. Oh yeah, mm. just like regular salsa. Well, we're gonna go with some fresh stuff here. This is great, you know, like first night or so in, or second night in. It's, uh, we're gonna have a little angel hell pasta. We got just walked into the store and bought some basic fresh ingredients. Got some angel hell pasta, a little little pesto, um, a baguette. Uh, baguettes hold up really good for backpacking because they're kind of tough. If you're gonna do pasta, angel hair works really well simply because it cooks real fast. I just usually keep a little kit of some of the more basic essential ingredients. You know, garlic obviously is such a Wonderful thing, gotta have lots of garlic. Uh, a little Parmesan cheese, um, little containers, they put things like onion powder, garlic, uh, pepper, uh, chili peppers, uh, dill, anything that you really wanna use for spices. And then the real trick is you get this pesto in the, in the bag, you just set it in there. And you can do all kinds of things, a little Parmesan cheese, sprinkle over the top. Now we did bring some, some shrimp here, we're kind of going gourmet with it here, but a little fresh shrimp, a little bit of garlic and you're ready to go. It's not Julia Child, but tastes good. Oh, this is a real simple one, you just take a couple tortillas, heat it up in the pan, lay down a little bit of cheese, kind of start melting the cheese a little bit, add some of the, the chili, and a bit of salsa, fold it over on itself and, and just cook it on both sides until everything's nice and hot and melted and you got yourself kind of a little burrito quesadilla thing and it's uh, really quite good. Impress your friends and eat well out there. A food dehydrator costs between $50 and $150 depending on the model you choose, but when you take a look at the prices of packaged camping foods, you'll see why a food dehydrator can pay for itself in a hurry. Don't go away. Exploring Idaho will be right back. Still ahead, the roughest mail route in the country will jump on board the boat that delivers letters to the farthest reaches of Hell's Canyon. Imagine that you're a mailman for a day. Now just play along with this for a minute. 
you're a mailman, and your worst fear is probably an angry dog that wants to take a bite out of you. Well, you're about to meet a mailman, but he has a lot more to worry about than mean dogs. Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhardt has his story. That's right, he has a lot more to worry about, because every week this mailman hops in a jet boat, negotiates rough rapids and swift river currents to deliver the mail up to the furthest reaches of Hell's Canyon. It's a tradition decades old, and recently the Hell's Canyon mailboat has opened its doors to tourists. Guests can ride along, play mailmen for the day, and at the same time, sightsee in the deepest river gorge in North America. The Hell's Canyon mailboat departs every Wednesday morning. Every week, every Wednesday. Rain or shine or sleet or hail. High water, low water, we go up. From this dock on the Snake River near Lewiston, Idaho. You guys ready for the tour? We are ready. ready. We are ready. This week, a group of 10 guests will ride comfortably on the 40-foot passenger jet boat that delivers Hell's Canyon mail. We have good friends who took this trip about five years ago, and they really enjoyed it. Well, it sounds like a good idea. Here's where we're headed, 100 miles into the deepest river canyon in North America. Hell's Canyon was first settled in the early 1900s. Homesteaders, ranchers, and miners scratched out an existence in the steep rocky hillsides. In 1912, the first mailboats connected Hell's Canyon families to the outside world. But even then, the swift, treacherous river made delivery of the mail uncertain. Today, Beamer's Hell's Canyon Tours delivers the mail each week with a high-powered aluminum jet boat. So with the guests on board and the mail bag safely stowed in the bow, the boat departs for a two-day river adventure. Good morning, everybody. Welcome aboard Beamer's Hell's Canyon Tour this morning. My name is Buck Pilot, and I'll be your captain for the next couple days. Buck Pilot serves as captain, mailman, and tour guide. And at one time, there was close to 350 mail stops here in the canyon. It took them about four days to do it. Now there's about a dozen, and it takes us two days to do it. Okay, if everybody's set, we'll head up the river. The boat cruises easily through the flat water that separates Idaho on our left from Washington on our right. We pass through the busy port of Lewiston, the furthest inland port in the west. Then at a cruising speed of 35 miles an hour, the jet boat quickly leaves the industrial shorelines behind. It's beautiful. It really is fascinating. The rock formation is very interesting and uh, everything about it. Well, it's a place of a really awesome raw beauty. I would say it's raw beauty because it's not man-made. Very little, very little of man's desecration of nature shows. And some of the, the ranches are for the most part, just seem to be two old Western ranches. Bob and Gloria Cooper from Spokane, Washington are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary with this trip. Their friends, Wally and Billy LeSage from Butte, Montana, are also celebrating a 50th wedding anniversary. And what better way? Hey, I think I died and went to heaven. Really? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. If they don't have a thing like this in heaven, I ain't going. <laughs> no way, shape, or form. This is beautiful and uh, I didn't even know it existed. Hell's Canyon has a way of keeping itself secret. Maybe it's the intimidating terrain or the swift current that keeps the average tourist at bay. But the abundance in Hell's Canyon is what attracted the first humans here. Thousands of years ago, the ancestors to recent Indian tribes hunted these hillsides. They survived well with large herds of bighorn sheep, elk, and deer. That's a little mill deer, though. We'll see a lot of deer along the river. Besides a few homesteads, very little has changed in thousands of years. In one place, we touch shore and walk just a short distance up a trail to peer directly into the lives of those early humans with the help of some clues they thoughtfully left behind. We've got over 300 sets of uh, Indian riding in the canyon. This, this particular set here is the best we have. Jeez. Nobody knows what they say, 
We've had a bunch of ar archaeologists and everybody come out here and uh, try to interpret what they say, but nobody knows what they say. We have our own little theory, the top guy there with the antennas. We always say that uh, that's proof that aliens have been here on Earth. I see antelope and I see some animal up in the top right-hand corner. Oh, I, I didn't see that. For 90-year-old Margaret Morgan, the petroglyphs and this mail run are the result of eight years of dreaming. I sat in a rocking chair for about eight years and now I'm able to travel again. Recovered from two hip replacements and inspired by another 90-year-old friend who made the trip, Margaret makes her way through tattered remains of early homesteads. She can only imagine what life was like for those first white settlers. Oh, I wanted to do this the worst way. I almost cried back there. I was so excited. <laughs> I get that way. We have a lot of senior citizens that get to see the canyon where they would not get to see it otherwise. You know, just because of this invention right here. And everybody's entitled to see this canyon if they want, you know, because there's no place like it. That's a little kid's swing for sure. Look at how mossy and rotten the seed is now. Can you imagine somebody cranking out a living here? But while these old homesteads rot away, plenty new homes upriver wait for the mail. With duty calling, Captain Buck departs for the business at hand. Basically, there's no way in and out of the canyon for the ranchers, you know. So we deliver the mail. That way they don't have to spend all day going to town and all day coming back. The same 32-cent stamp that delivers a piece of regular mail brings these letters into Hell's Canyon. Mailboxes perch precariously along the riverbank, waiting for that one special day of the week. The delivery brings letters, magazines, and news of the day. The address, by the way, is simply Snake River Route, Lewiston, Idaho. Some of the addresses, like over here across the creek, is Getter Creek. That's their address, Lewis and Idaho, Getter Creek. Then down there, Dry Creek, they put Dry Creek on it. Dug Bar and stuff like that, but it's all Lewis and Idaho River out. And if they don't have the like, Dry Creek on it down there, Bob and Mary Talbot, they, they manage that ranch, and we know them all by name. Yeah. So we know who, who the mail goes to. Another familiar face along the route is this bushy bearded homesteader. Joe Mathers hikes three and a half miles every Wednesday to meet the mail boat. Not much different than the first settlers to get the mail back in 1912. But some things have changed, like the content of the letters themselves. Seems to be probably about half advertising and half letters. That's right, junk mail. Just goes to show you're not safe no matter where you hide. After the long day of sightseeing and mail delivery, the boat pulls into a dock at Copper Creek Lodge. 70 miles up Hell's Canyon, every board and nail used to build the place was hauled in by boat. Home sweet home. <laughs> Surrounded by trees and softened by the soothing sound of the river, it's a setting that relaxes body and mind. This place I think is misnamed. They call this Hell's Canyon, but this is a, not a little bit, but this is a lot of bit of heaven, I think. <laughs> Beautiful. It's beautiful. Wildlife. We saw deer coming up the river and uh, bighorn Rocky Mountain sheep up on the high, high plateau on the Idaho side. And now we've got deer roaming around here. Inside the lodge, the chefs serve up an impressive prime rib dinner. Oh, boy, ambrosia. But nothing can match the incredible scenery that surrounds us on the outside. There's no other country like it in the world. You know, it's got a rugged beauty to it, and people enjoy that. More amazing still, our discovery that people live and work in this canyon today, and we've had the rare privilege to touch their lives, if only by delivering the mail. It really was neat. And you just you sort of wonder what messages it brings. It is beautiful in there. And the return trip is just as spectacular. We even stopped and looked at some of the historic ranches along the way. Oh, that would be a real bonus. Yeah, it was it, fun. Is it pretty hard to get a seat on the boat? Um, not too bad. The riverboat runs 52 times a year because they deliver the mail every week. 
but it is a good idea to make a reservation. Well, we'll tell people how to do that a little bit later on in the show. But right now, today's Idaho Puzzler. There are many stories surrounding the history of mail service in Idaho. Do you know what major event forever changed the delivery of Idaho's mail back in 1926? The answer when Exploring Idaho returns. What was it? What major change drastically affected the delivery of Idaho's mail back in 1926? Well, it was a significant moment in Idaho's history when Barney Airlines began flying commercial air mail. The air mail service connected the wild western state of Idaho to the rest of the country. And the first piece of mail to go out on that first mail plane back in 1926? A package of two prize Idaho potatoes addressed to President Calvin Coolidge. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you've seen in our show today, call for a copy of the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. The Field Notes contain names and phone numbers on each of the stories in this program. Be sure to ask for show number 147. Thanks for watching this edition of Exploring Idaho. We'll see you again next time.